Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Madas, a second year AM resident, for those of you who may not know me. Um, and the topic for my presentation today is four minutes and counting, resuscitated hysterotomy. Special thanks to all of Drs. Kendall, Chu, and those who helped me put this presentation together, gave me a few pointers. So resuscitative hysterotomy, AKA perimortem section. Um, my outline for my presentation would be a small case, some maternal physiology that's relevant, brief history on the procedure itself, indications and contraindications, the procedure and controversies and conclusion. So here we have a 25 year old female, 30 weeks pregnant, no past medical history, she was brought in after an MPC where she was seat belted, but the car was T bolted on the driver's side. No airbags were deployed. Well, airbags were deployed. No windshields were broken, and the patient did not ambulate, but she was uh, extricated by EMS. She endured severe abdominal pain. Her vital signs upon triage: borderline blood pressure 93 over 65. She was tachycardic, and the rest were normal. Um, going on the ATLS pathway, general appearance, she's anal times three. She appears in pain holding her abdomen. Her airway was intact. She was actually able to describe what happened. A C collar was placed. Breath sounds were bilateral and symmetric as well as chest rise. Nasal cannula was placed at 100% oxygen as per um, AHA guidelines for cardiac or, um, unstable pregnant patients. Uh, her pulses were palpable but slightly cool extremities. Um, deformities, her pupils were equal, there were no focal neurological deficits. Um, exposure, her abdomen was tender, her pelvis was stable, there was no vaginal bleeding, no spinal tenderness or step-offs. The fast was negative and since we already had the probe on her abdomen, we assessed her fetal heart rate, which was um, 90, so the fetus was in distress. Okay, so being in an astute position as we all are, uh, we notice that that blood pressure it is a borderline blood pressure, even for a pregnant patient, especially for a pregnant patient, because, um, well, I'll get to that later. So we know that the uterus is compressed by the, it compresses the vena cava, which reduces the blood flow towards the heart. So to do this, we just displace the uterus to the left to relieve some of that pressure, which can then increase the cardiac output by 60 to 80% from what it was get, um, originally gotten. So you can either put like uh, some sheets under the patient to elevate, to push them over to the left side by 30% or do manual displacement with two hand method seen in the image there or one hand method, remembering not to compress, but just shift over to the left. Okay. So regarding that, the uterus is compressing organs and moving organs, organs out of the way. Um, again, as I stated before, the blood, the blood um, volume for the patient, um, based on the estrogen and other hormones that are involved in pregnant patients, their blood volume increases to about 35 to 40%, as well as their cardiac output. So that blood pressure that you see there, it can be the actual blood pressure, but you wouldn't actually see, um, you may not see hypotension before 40% of the blood is actually lost. So she could be bleeding in her abdomen and you wouldn't know. Um, regarding her presentation, you see, you, you start thinking, okay, this patient is critical. You may have to eventually intubate this patient. And with pregnant patients, airway management is very important because they already have a reduced um, oxygen reserve because of compression from the diaphragm. Um, so regarding the uh, actual anatomy, their airway is very edematous, friable, and hyperemic. So you kind of want to do it in one pass if you can, because you don't want to damage the area more. Something also to keep in mind is the stomach is pushed up, so this end is delayed gastric emptying, so they have a risk of aspiration. So just be mindful of those things. All right, so as you thought, the patient eventually became hypertensive, great cardiac and pulseless. So ACL is pathway. We start doing CPR for this patient. While you do CPR, just it's in the same general position as any other patient maybe one, one or two centimeters a little higher, but you still have to do the same depth. And while you're doing the CPR, you still do the left uterine displacement. And as you're thinking, you're starting to prepare for the perimortem C-section. Just a brief history on this procedure. It went from postmortem to perimortem. Uh, the first official documented uh, postmortem C-section was in 7, 715 BC where a Roman king said that the fetus should not be delivered with the deceased mother. 
So after the mother died, the fetus was cut out and buried separately. Um, in the 1600s, Europe actually passed laws stating that if the physician does not do this, it's considered murder and a Sicilian physician was actually arrested and put to death for this. Um, in the 18, mid 1800s, the utility of this post-mortem C-section was assessed um, because as it was done as a last resort to save the fetus, the survival rates for the fetus were pretty low. Here you can see 14%, 0%, 2%. Um, so, they, so they didn't know if this was actually beneficial at all until about the 1980s when the first post-mortem C-section was done by this article here you can see where the mother and the offspring both survived. It was a 25-year-old female who um, came in after hemophysis. She was bronzed, eventually went into um, cardiopulmonary arrest. And after 25 minutes, actually, the mother and the fetus both survived. And 20 months after this um, incident, both of them were neurologically normal, which was amazing. Um, that during that same time period, the, a rule called the four-minute rule um, was implemented regarding the regarding paramortem C-section, um, which said basically for, by the four minutes after CPR, you initiate the, the C-section and the fetus should be delivered by the fifth minute, AKA five minutes for that whole thing to happen. Um, because for neurological outcomes, the thought is that within five to six minutes of decreased brain um, blood, blood flow to the brain, you um, suffer from anoxic brain injury. So that will kind of have the best um, neurological outcomes for the fetus and the mother. This rule was again revisited in 2005 and currently. Uh, so the first one was by the same author who did the, who came up with the four minute rule. Um, and his article was saying, does the four minute rule still apply to the fetal outcomes as well as does it impact maternal CPR? His, he went through, a lot of these um, studies I'm talking about are gonna be case series because it's kind of unethical to do a um, placebo for perimodal C-sections. So in this case series review, it was 38 cases, 28 of which inference survived. Um, and it had two sets of twins and one set of triplets, surprisingly, um, varying gestational age from 24 to 42 weeks. And of the, all of the infants that survived, 25 of them, um, there was documented time frame for this um, C-section. 56% uh, were normal, which was 14 of, of the patients. And 1% had other um, pre prenatal um, conditions such as hearing loss, uh, chronic respiratory illnesses, and 20% had neurological sequelae. Three of these, um, cases did not report what actually happened to the fetus. Of those that were normal, the highest percentage was within the zero to five minute time period where eight infants were born and normal meaning that they were normal for that gestational age. Um, and four, four um, individuals are actually born 15 minutes or uh, beyond. I think the max was 25 or 30 minutes. So this just showed that yes, five minutes um, they have the best outcome. However, it's it's not a guarantee. You can still have good outcomes past that time frame. Regarding the maternal um, impact that uh, perimodal C-section has, um, of these cases, 18 actually documented uh, the hemodynamics for the mother, 12 of which had a ROS or return of blood pressure after the perimodal C-section. And the, the article said that there were no reports of worsening hemodynamic status. Um, basically means that the patient survived because the patient's already in cardiac arrest, so can't get worse, you know? Um, all right. So but even though that four minute rule is, seems like it, it's not exact, it's still used um, today for assessment of these patients in cardiac arrest. And it's one of the indications actually. Um, other indications include peri-arrest, so basically coming close to arrest, and fetal viability. So that, depending on where you are, it's either 22 to 24 weeks. And this information will not always be given to you. Um, so you can do estimated gestational age based on where the uterus, the, the fundus is in relation to the umbilicus. So the umbilicus is roughly 20 to 22 weeks. So anything at or above the umbilicus is an indication for doing this section once it's warranted. Contraindications is the fetus is not viable. 
Um, then you aggressively resuscitate the mother. And if ROSC is achieved within four minutes, aka two rounds of CPR. And an important thing that I saw, uh, there's 20 to 30% fetal survivability at 24 weeks and onward if the perimortem C-section is performed in scenarios where there's appropriate neonatal care um, exists. So the procedure itself. Unlike an AD, unlike upstairs at OBGYN, we're not going to have this laid out for us. So we basically use what we have, which for sanitation purposes, we can use chloroprep, uh, make sure you have a pen blade uh, scalpel, uh, blunt scissors, a Kelly's or hemostat, the Kelly's you can actually find in the chest tube tray, um, abdominal pads and suture kit and observable sutures. Okay, because we're resuscitating, the fetus is also involved. You can find the, all the equipment that you need for the uh, neonatal resuscitation part um, by the trauma bay and peeps. Never forget to get help, okay? We're not heroes, we need help, okay? Get OB, respiratory, make you everyone that you know would be important in this case. So regarding the procedure. Um, first for us, what we will do is a midline cut either from the xiphoid process or the top of the umbilical fundus. Um, and you go straight down the midline. You can bypass the, um, you can bypass the umbilicus um, just for um, cosmetic reasons. You go straight down, you cut through all the layers up to the peritoneum. When you reach the peritoneum, then you'll come to, towards the uterus. The reason for making a midline cut in the, when you would do it in the uterus, but also from the skin is to prevent major blood loss. The patient's in cardiac arrest, so it might not have much blood loss, but you wanna prevent any blood, um, major blood bleeding from cutting any vessels and also nerve damage. Once you make the midline cut, you deliver the fetus, you clamp the cords, you cut the tube, uh, you, you may have to apply some fundal pressure. You also deliver the, the placenta, so you actually go inside and you scoop it out, like you, you scoop it out. And then you pack the uterus with abdominal, um, abdominal pads, and you can also pack the GI tract and you suture it close. What they recommend for sutures is the, it's the, like a locking stitch, which I've never done. Um, it looks like simple interrupted, but you kind of overlap them on top of each other. Um, again, remember MICU, Gen Surge, all of them should be involved in this because the patient would need to go to the OR eventually. Here's a quick video. Here's a quick video showing you the procedure. You guys will see a familiar face in it, actually. Um, or a crash These are Okay, so I'm palpating abdomen. I clearly have a lady in cardiac arrest, uh, palpably pregnant, right? Fund is well above the umbilicus. So I have my indication to do the procedure, uh, and I'm going to start right at the top, up at the xiphoid, and I'm making a pretty big incision just vertically all the way down to the synthesis. I'm not a surgeon, right? Leon's a surgeon, but for me, I got to cut a few times to get through all these layers, especially for this lady. Okay, you can bluntly dissect as you need. Okay, and at this stage, you can have your assistant retract. I've got uterus here, bladder low down, making a smallish incision in my uterus to get umbilical fluid splash out there. And I'm just putting my fingers in because I don't want to use scalpel the whole way and risk cutting baby. Using my fingers to protect as I'm opening up the uterus. And for me, I gotta make a big incision, right? This is not cosmetic. Reaching in for baby's head. Baby is head down. That's me. Oh my gosh. And sometimes you need some fundal pressure from the top there to help deliver baby. That's you, Brett. Your fundal pressure. The fundus is at the top. <laughs> Got it, buddy. <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> right? Next step in baby, you're clamping the cords, two clamps cut between them, right? Don't make the rookie mistake of cutting on either side. You're passing baby off to your neonatologist who's now doing the hard part, right? <laughs> 
Tell me you're going to breastfeed. <laughs> okay? You're, you're back at maybe, you still need to deliver placenta, right? Placenta is the part of this that consumes all the oxygen. And now, if you're a surgeon, you're making the layers nice. I'm not a surgeon, so I'm packing the abdomen with sterile towels. We use this, we have this. You're closing, and if I have a stapler, which I do not, I'm stapling the skin shut. Okay. So that's just a brief overview of the procedure itself. Okay, almost done, guys. So just some controversies that arise from this procedure. One, it's not done with consent. Uh, so you're wondering if you're violating the mother's autonomy. Um, however, this is an emergency procedure and it's done to save the mother and the fetus. So it's something to be mindful of, but it's still an emergency procedure. Uh, we as ED physicians, we're performing a procedure that we can't repair. The patient eventually needs to go to the OR to uh, repair this procedure if the patient does survive. Um, and also there's a fear of litigation. Uh, there have been cases where people were sued for not performing this procedure when it was indicated. So that's also something to be mindful of. But again, this is an emergency procedure, okay? Um, other things, these are just two articles that I briefly skimmed. Uh, they, they were talking about um, the ethics behind the procedure and religious um, connotations towards it as well. So just some learning points. Four minutes is a rule, but however, when you see that the patient needs that this may be a procedure that the patient needs, then you, go, you do it. The umbilicus at or above is roughly 20 to 24 weeks gestation, estimated gestational age, and that's an indication that you can do it. Resuscitate the mother. So good quality chest compressions is necessary and is the key as well. And apply left and uterine uh, displacement. And the procedure, again, comes cycloid process or uterine fundus to the pubic surfaces, All right? So that's my presentation, guys. Uh, this is my uh, resource letter and any questions? Questions, comments? Oh, I thought that was a good job. Yeah, nice work. Okay. Yeah. All right, there is a question. Mm -hmm. um, Roosh actually asked, is there any preference discussion in the literature on its utility for medical versus trauma, like perimortem? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one, if it's if it's if it's trauma, then you if it's trauma, then you first address all the other issues too. But you will still perform the procedure because one, the it's again it's done to resuscitate the mother. So you taking out the fetus would relieve some of that um, pressure on the IVC. So and she needs adequate blood flow. That part I saw in an article, but otherwise, specifically the indication for when you would do it, no, I'm not sure. I can get back to you, but I'm not sure. Okay. Awesome. All right. Great job. <laughs>